to read the message early, um, Teacher Nimol actually wanted us not to come yesterday, but I read the message when we were already there. So we went ahead with the worship service anyway. But um, we understand their uh, thinking. When we arrived, there were very few uh, people, but I think when they saw that we went ahead with the service, slowly they came. But uh, we may not go there uh, for the next few weeks as until uh, the government resume uh, classes as well here in Simrip. So let's pray for that. And uh, one good thing is I'm sure that they are very safe in the villages because uh, there are no, really no visitors going there or if there are very few, uh, but just passing by going to Kulen Mountain, and they're not uh, staying at the village, so they're uh, safe over there. And um, actually, Teacher Samnang's family, they often go to Road 60 for just for some uh, fun time, but uh, they have decided to uh, just stay at Chenso for now. And uh, let's just continue to pray for one another as well. And we have read a uh, chapter this morning, Though we are not going to uh, study from that, we're only going to get one verse from uh, um, the New Testament um, this morning. So I would like everyone to stand, please, and um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, dear Lord, for uh, this morning, for you giving us the opportunity once again to study your word. And uh, even at this time that we're going to use to, uh, for preaching, dear Lord, I pray that you uh, empower me. Uh, may the Holy Spirit move, dear Lord, mightily in our midst and uh, to be a challenge to us, Lord. I pray that you rebuke us as a church if we see, dear Lord, that there are things that we are lacking um, uh, according to the standard of your word. I pray, Lord, that our goal, though, um, uh, though we are not a perfect church, but our goal is to slowly uh, mature into the church that you want us to be. I pray, Lord, that you guide me as well. Remind me of the things that I have studied, dear Lord. And uh, as, as this message is a blessing to me, I pray, Lord, that this will be a challenge and a blessing to everyone as well. May you forgive us of our sins and may your name, only your name be glorified in our midst. For these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. And uh, I would like to start a new series, but it's not going to be a book series, but it's going the series is called The Biblical New Testament Church. And uh, uh, my goal in this series is to sh see in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, what a church should look like, and, what, and then we can gauge and look at our church and see if we are there, or if we are going in the right direction, or uh, what else we can improve upon here in our church. And um, I, I got this series from reading a book, um, and the book was a blessing to me. It was really a challenge, and that's the reason why, um, if you notice that uh, by the grace of God, I'm really zealous upon trying to get things right and get things correctly according to the Word of God, because there, that is where the blessing lies. That is where the blessing lies. One, if we do the work of God, this morning it was emphasized that we do the work of God while agreeing with the Lord on how to do the work of God. There's no way that we, are, we can do the ministry of the Lord without agreeing with Him on how to do the ministry of the Lord. It's not the way we think it has to be done. It's not the way we, we know it has to be done. It is the way the Bible tells us how it should be done. And that is our goal. And, the reason why I want to st uh, and, and that's the reason why I want to start this series. And... Um, um, we can say today that many churches are trying their best to be a biblical New Testament church. And we can, I can say as well that this church is doing its part. But a biblical New Testament church, if we really read the Bible and see all of the traits there, I don't think we can point to a single church today in this world and say that this is what the biblical New Testament church is. There are always lapses. There are always churches that are, uh, there are always things that we neglect. Um, no church is perfect. And we know that. And the picture of the spotless bride of Christ that he's going to present someday, his church, is not happening now. It's not perfect now. It's going to be someday. God is continually going to work on the church and we are experiencing that now. God is working on our church and, that, and, and while we're growing towards the Lord, we're also experiencing growing pains. Pains that um, uh, maybe mistakes or, or, or realizations uh, or uh, things that we were zealous about before realize that it was wrong. It's not an easy task. It's not an easy job. It takes 
a long time it will take the uh, the cooperation of everybody it will take um, what they call this the unity of the church and the same commitment to being a biblical New Testament church if we are someday going to be this kind of church a biblical New Testament church we know there are a lot of traits they min they maintain regenerate church membership we love Christ first. We have uh, a New Testament church needs to have qualified leaders. We need to have a disciplined environment, an atmosphere of love towards one another. We need to be strong in word and prayer. We need to be rebuking and reproving one another. We need to be zealous for biblical separation. We need to be careful about music. Women should be keepers at home. Men should be building families that are strong for the Lord. Members should have a strong Bible reading habit. Uh, we should all be hardworking in this church. We need to build godly homes. We need to disciple the youth. We need to educate and protect the, the body of every spiritual danger. We have to have a strong vision for evangelism and world, world missions. And we need to be able able to train preachers as well and these things that i mentioned right now we can see some of them in our church but some of them we are uh, we may be lacking or we may be tr uh, forgetting and the job of preachers that are standing behind this pulpit is to constantly remind us of things that we may be forgetting to constantly remind us to be mindful of what we're doing here in the local church and how we should do things in the local church now we're going to start the series and look at how the bible describes the biblical local new testament church how the bible describes that and we're going to going to skip the part of it being local and uh, this is something that we study in our uh, we're going to study in our bible classes every week but then we know that the church is local we don't we do not uh, believe that the church is universal or there's this one uh, uh, one church movement in in the world we do not believe that and this morning we're going to start with one one of the most clear description of the church which is found in first timothy chapter 3 verse 15 we're going to start with this first and we're going to expound on this verse and the, the first uh, the title of the first preaching today is the house of god the pillar and the ground of truth what did the bible says in first timothy chapter 3 verse 14 and 15 the Bible says here, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. So this is Paul talking to Timothy. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know the, the, uh, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. So we're going to start with this very clear um, description of what the New Testament church should be. It should be the house of God, not only the house of God, but the house of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. And when you read this verse, it should be not only as a, a challenge to us as a church, it should also serve as a rebuke. If you see, are we the house of God? Are we the pillar? Are we, uh, are we lifting up the truth? Are we grounded in the truth? And if we see that we are lacking in this part, it needs to be a rebuke to our church. We need to be rebuked to go back to the foundations of the truth and lift nothing but the truth in this church. And that's the reason why I'm, I'm trying to preach uh, uh, on this and let's see uh, some principles that we can gather uh, uh, from this verse and then um, it's, it's up to you how you can see our church right now you see yourself and how you can help as a member on how to reach this kind of uh, description can we be described as the house of the living God the pillar and the ground of truth and our goal is to honestly say that we can be that number one here let's, let's look at the house of God the Bible says the verse says how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. The first description here of the church is the church is the house of God. Under the law of Moses, the house of God was a tabernacle. The Bible says in First Chronicles 6, 48, their brethren also, the Levites, were appointed unto all manner of service of the tabernacle of the house of God. And we know this tabernacle. Actually, this week, this is our going, going to be our topic in the book of Exodus in, uh, in my class tomorrow, actually. It is the tabernacle, the house of God. Now, here in the tabernacle, there are many people who are working, people who are taking care of all the vessels, people who are uh, butchering the sacrifice, and the priests who are actually doing the sacrifice, and people who are allowed to go inside 
uh, uh, the tabernacle into the Holy of Holies. Many people are working in the house of God here in the Old Testament with, with different, uh, what they call this, uh, responsibilities and different jobs, which is the same thing today. The house of God, which is the church, is functioning because of members who are doing their part as, uh, as a member of this church. And then later on, we see in Second Chronicles chapter 3, verse 3, that this house of God would later on be the temple at Jerusalem. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 3, verse 3, Now these are the things wherein Solomon was instructed for the building of the house of God. The length by cubits of, after the, measure, the first measure was three score cubits and the, the breadth and the breadth 20 cubits. Now we know that Solomon was given the opportunity, the privilege to be the one to build the temple at Jerusalem. And his father, though he wanted to do that, David, uh, it, he, uh, God did not allow him, though his um, motive was correct, his desire was correct, but it was not the will of God for him. So, but God gave it to Solomon, and Solomon was able to build this wonderful temple at Jerusalem. And we can read that. In your own time, you can read the description of the temple at Jerusalem. And now in the, New, in the New Testament, I'm not preaching replacement theology here, but now in the New Testament, what the house of God is, is the local New Testament church. It is the church that, ref, or it is the house of God refers to an assembly with pastors and deacons. In, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in short, the place that we are in now, the, the people we are with now, this is the house of God. Ito po ang tahanan ng Panginoon. And what are the things that are implied if the church is the house of God? First here, if the church is the house of God, then this should be the most important house for us. If the church is the house of God, it must be the most important house for us. Whenever, uh, whenever we watch television or you watch Netflix, there is a, a show there uh, that talks about beautiful houses around the world. There are houses that are right in the middle of the forest. There are houses at the uh, cliff uh, on the cliff of mountains and these houses are some of them are built on the wings of an airplane which are very beautiful houses me and my wife when we watch that it may one would it would just make you think that if i can just live in that kind of house uh i'd have everything in this world it's a wonderful house everything for uh, you can you can just stay there and not leave the house anymore but however wonderful houses today are the most important house for the believer or the child of God must be the church. That must be the most important house. It should be time for us as members of this church to take this house of God, take this church very seriously. This is the house of God. This is the house of the creator. This is the house of the person who saved you. This is the house of the person who is continuing to sustain you today. This is the house of the one who is protecting you today. And in our mind, in our hearts, this must be the most important important house in the world and we must we must always realize that in this house we are to protect each other in this house we are to love one another in this house of god there should be an atmosphere of love why because if we're in the house of god and we're not behaving ourselves uh, properly we're not behaving ourselves according to the way god wants his house to behave then we are outside the will of god the bible says in galatians chapter 5 verse 13 to 15 for brethren you have been called unto liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another that is what we should be doing here in the house of God serving one another verse 14 for all the law is fulfilled in one word even this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself verse 15 but if ye bite and devour one another take heed that ye be not consumed of one another if we are fighting if we are dividing ourselves among each other if we are biting one another then slowly but surely we are killing this house of god here in shibrib slowly but surely we're killing the assembly we're killing the place where god purpose and place here to give glory to his name to 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 send the gospel to to every place here in shimrip and and and, and uh, even outside shimrip and if we are in this house of god and if this house of god is important for us we're going to love it if we say that we love if we if we love the heart the, the house of god we are going to give importance to it now we are trying to be biblical here. Now here in Galatia, what is happening here is they're not trying to be biblical, but they're going to the extreme of being legalists. Right? We're not legalists. We're trying to be biblical. If we are legalists, what will happen is we're going to bite one another. We're going to look at what each other are, do each other are doing, and then we're going to try to find faults and mistakes and then throw it at one another that is not what we should do we're not we're not legalists we're biblicists and we should not also be liberal 
too liberal. Why? Because we can go to another extreme and then condone sin and not correct and not discipline members anymore. What we are trying to do here, our goal is that in this church, we're going to do what the Bible says and exactly and only what the Bible says, not go to any extreme. And, and, and by implication, if this church is important, is the most important house on earth for the members, this means that we should not miss church gathering. Right? That is implied there. If this house is the house of God, and if this house of God is the most important house for you, in your heart, you know that you should not be missing church gathering. This place should be where we are whenever there's gathering. The church should be our reason for missing everything else. Right? We should not have other reasons to miss church. Right? You can miss everything else except the assembling of ourselves together. What did the Bible says in Hebrews 10.25? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now is the time when we can still show our love for the assembling of the church together. We have all the reasons now not to come to church. We can say that if we're not going to uh, school to be safe, we should not come to church to be safe as well. We can just stay at home, read the Bible, pray, sing songs to the Lord, or maybe stream the preaching live and listen to it. We can do that, but the Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And the Bible says here, so much the more, so much the more. As you see the day approaching. Now we cannot, uh, we, we don't have signs for the rapture. But one thing we know, that when, as every day comes, every day goes, the rapture, the coming of the Lord is coming closer. It's coming closer. It's not going farther away. It's coming closer. And the Bible says, as long as it's coming closer, uh, the longer you become a Christian, your attitude and your, the importance you give to, to, to assembling of ourselves together should be more. Hindi po pabawas ng pabawas. Hindi po palamig ng palamig ang pag natin sa church. The Bible says, as you grow as a Christian, your zeal and your zealousness and your love for coming to church should grow more and more. The Bible says so much the more. Do we love, do we give importance still to church attendance today? Or you can be present on every church attendance, but your heart is not here as well. That is also forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That is also uh, guilty of forsaking the assembling of ourselves. If you're here and your heart is not here, you're guilty as well. You're also forsaking the assembling of, our, of, of the church. If you're here and you're not listening to preaching, you're also forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. If you're here or you're always late, you're also forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It's not just you're sitting there. We're not here to check our attendance. We're here to see if you're here one with the church, worshiping God, giving your best, and giving glory to your name. That is how we give importance to church attendance. Hindi lang po basta umaattend. Our homeboys are here every time. Right? Uh, all of us are, all, almost all of us are here every church attendance. But the thing is, nandito din ba ang puso natin? Kung wala rin po, we might as well not come. We are also guilty of this verse. But the Bible says our zeal should be more and more and more as we grow as Christians. That should be the result. And if you see in our hearts that it's not that important to you anymore, then we should repent and then pray to God. Because this is the most important house of God. And if we, if we, can, if we say that this is the most important house in the world for us, then its ministry sh should be our priority as well. That is implied there. Its ministries should be our priority as well. We have a lot of activities in this world. We love to do a lot of things. I personally want to do a lot of things. I love, uh, I have a lot of hobbies. Uh, I play basketball. Uh, I, I, want, I, I want to always use my uh, PlayStation at home. But there are times that you, uh, it should not be the priority. I want to do a lot of things, watch movies. I, I want to binge on Netflix. But you know, if there is a ministry, I should prioritize that. I should not be doing anything else aside from the ministry of this local church. As long as there's a ministry, it should be the, it should be the priority. If this house is really important for you, it should be seen in your priorities as well. Now that the church is the house of God, it's implied here that it should be the most important house for ourselves. Next is, if the church is the house of God, it means that the church is only for God's children. Right? Think about it. You, are you going to invite a complete stranger to live with you under one roof with your family? You're not going to do that. Right? If you see someone hungry or walking around the street, you might give them food or water and maybe invite them inside for a while, but you're not going to invite them to live with you. 
right? Why? If the church is really the house of God, people inside the church should be the family of God, should be the children of God. That's why we are careful in accepting church membership. That's why we're careful in accepting people who want to be members. We want to make sure that members here are God's children. The only um, uh, most important uh, qualification of being a member of this church is if you are a born-again believer. That is the most, that's why we ask uh, people to give their salvation testimony. By giving their salvation testimony, we can see if, uh, if they are truly children of God. And if they are children of God, then they are welcome in the house of God. That's why uh, we are careful. We can see that what, it is only necessary for every member to be born again believer. Today, we, can, uh, we, we see a lot of churches who are in a hurry to baptize people. A lot of churches who are in a hurry to lift, to put people into office, to put people into leadership, to put people behind the pulpit when they are not yet, it's not yet time for them. Or worse, they are not yet saved. Look at perfectly good churches today who are replaced by younger preachers and younger pastors and they're going down the slippery slope. Right? Uh, one example is Katepunan, uh, 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 I don't know their, their church name, but the, the church of Pastor Gisalva. It is church, it's a church that we look up to, and, and, and they are lifting up the truth standard of God, but now it's, it has been replaced by his son. And I'm not even sure if it is the vote of the members or it's just a, a dynasty thing. But it was replaced by his son. And now uh, these preachers like Joey Salco are now allowed to preach there. And I was chatting with one of their members and he said that uh, many of us are leaving. We're starting house churches and this church is going to be divided. Why? Because the standard of God is not there anymore. The reason why is that because uh, though the first generation members of that church were zealous for the truth, they were careless in accepting members. They were careless in placing people into the church and now the church is being governed by people who do not have that importance for the truth. And that is what's going to happen to this church if we're not careful. If we're not careful to make sure that this house of God is only consists of uh, uh, genuine children of God. We can see this in Acts chapter 2 verse 41 and 42. The Bible says, Then the, they that gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You can say, well, you said that we have to be careful, but here, the same day they were baptized. You know, during this time, think about the situation. Christ has just been crucified. Right? They just killed Christ. The Savior, the people that this people, uh, the person that these people are trying to identify themselves with, being baptized during this time, identifying yourself with Christ, is like putting upon yourself a death sentence. Right? It's like uh, if, if they uh, if they uh, put to death someone today who is very guilty of something, and then you say that I am an accomplice, you you you're in trouble. Right? So now Christ has just been crucified, he resurrected, uh, and, people think, uh, and people think that he's guilty because publicly he was, uh, he was crucified. But these people, because they are truly saved, were not afraid to get baptized. They were baptized, and these people were truly saved. These are Jews, Jews who know the, the law of God. They were the ones who were protecting the word of God during this time. They have the Old Testament scriptures. They only have to believe that Christ is the Messiah. Now that they believe that Christ is the Messiah, they are truly saved, and then they were baptized. That's why today we should make sure that people that we baptize and accept in the church are saved people. And verse 42 strengthens the argument. The Bible says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship ship and in breaking of bread and in prayers this is the mark of a true believer they will have love for prayer they will have love for the word of god they will have love for the uh, fellowship of the brethren today you, you uh, there are churches who go out uh, try to go on soul winning uh, lead a, 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 a person to sinner's prayer baptize them the next sunday and then never see them again Right? They do not continue steadfastly in the doctrine. They do not continue, uh, they, they do not fellowship with the brethren. You will never see them again. What's worse, they may go back to the Catholic religion. They may go to other religions or to other cults and they were not truly saved. And if we are going to do that, we're slowly destroying the church. That the church is the house of God implies that it is only children of God who are inside churches today. Next that the church is the house of God, it means that the church is a family. We are God's children. We are a family. Think about it. What are you going to do for the protection of your family? What are you willing to do to protect your family? How, long, how far are you willing to go just to protect your own family? Now think, 
will you do the same thing for this church? Think, are you going, are you willing to do the same thing for this church? Because this church is the house of God. And God is our Father. And this church is a family. Are we willing to give our lives, our all, for the protection of this church? Are we give, willing to lay our lives on the line to make sure that this church will still remain here in Simrib and will continue to preach the gospel and to glorify the Lord? And if we love our own families at home, we should have that same love for the house of God, for the people of God, for the church of God. This church is a family. And the reason why I say this is not because so that when you go, you will, you'll send your tithes back here. But this church is a family. The reason why I'm saying this is because of the love we need to have for one another. That love we need to have for one another. Inside a family, there are problem children as well. Right? Inside a family, there are children who are disobedient. In this church, there are disobedient members. There are, di there are people who are still not on that uh, realization in life yet that we only have to obey Christ. But we are not to be impatient with these people. We are to continually love them and guide them to where they're supposed to be. This church is a family. Another one, what is implied, uh, 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 be, this church being the house of God. It means that this is where the house of God is where God's business is conducted. Under the authority of the church. If this is the house of God, God's business should be conducted in the church. That's why you have to realize a ministry that is not under the authority of the local church is not a ministry at all. Right. Today, people are so far from the Bible that we, we have these so-called lady missionaries. I'm not against ladies who go to foreign field and work for the Lord. I love that. But these lady missionaries who are coming, we know a lot of, a lot of them, they don't want to be members of a church. They want to do what they want, go into any village they want, uh, conduct services whenever they want without accountability at all to any church. They, they want to just do what they want. You know, that is not a ministry at all. If we are to conduct God's business, it has to be in the church. Amen. I'm not saying to get everyone in this building and witness to them, but it has to be under the authority of this church. Amen. When we go out to our outreaches, this church has commissioned us to go. That is under the authority of this church. Anything other than that is not a ministry at all. It is something that you just want to do out of disobedience to the word of God. The Bible is clear. Uh, glory to God in the church. Everything that was done here is under the authority of local church. The, the missionary journeys of Paul and Barnabas are under that authority of the church who sent them. And when they started these churches, they gave the authority to these churches to preach the gospel. And this church should be where the, the business of God is conducted. What is the business of God? March 18, 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. That is the business of God. And if we are to evangelize Cambodia, it has to be under the authority of the local church. You can preach the gospel. Make sure that you are in the authority of the local church. Make sure that you are a member of the local church. You know, people who do not want to be a member of the local church, are, it's, it's just like saying Christ gave his life for the church, gave his blood for the church, established the church here on earth, but I don't care at all. I don't care. So, so what if Christ established the church? I don't want to be part of the church. That is not how we're supposed to conduct our business. We are supposed to conduct it under the ministry of the local church. That's why we're so blessed that we're inside a local church. We're so blessed that we are inside a church that is preaching the gospel and we are taking this gospel outside or all around Cambodia and preaching the gospel to people. And this is something that God blesses. Why? Because we are doing it the way God wants us to do it. And, there is, and, and, and all of these things, even missionaries that we send, it has to be with the authority of the local church. Acts chapter 13 verse 1. One. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and uh, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, and uh, which had been brought up with Hero the Tetrarch and Saul. You see here, there are men in this church at, uh, uh, at, at, at Antioch men who were uh, looked up to, men who were prepared by the Lord, men who were leaders of this church. Look, there is Barnabas. We know who is Barnabas and we know what kind of person he was. He was also a person who was going on missionary journeys. We see Simeon here. Simeon being a Jew by birth, 
but he may be an, we, by his name uh, we, we, we may say that he's an African Jew he was called Niger it's either he adopted that name or he was just called that because of his complexion Lucius who may be one of the uh, those who first came to Antioch preaching the gospel when when, when, when the church at Jerusalem was, were disbanded Manaen who was in close relationship with Herod the wicked ruler but was saved by God changed by God and now a leader of the church and Saul and we know who Saul is and, uh, and also known as Paul who went on missionary journeys what are these people doing in this church verse number 2 as they ministered to the Lord and fasted these people are busy in the work of God ministering the Lord and fasted the Holy Ghost said separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them who did the Holy Ghost address it to to the church to the church the church separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. What is that work? So that they can go uh, 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 on missionary journeys and establish churches and, and, and bring the gospel to the Gentile people. Verse 3, And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Who are these? The church. The church has the authority even to send missionaries. You are not supposed to just go on your own missionary journey without the authority of the church. Uh, the, I read the Bible. The Lord is calling me. Uh, I will go to this uh, uh, country and preach the gospel. That is the making of a cult. Right? You interpret the Bible by yourself without the guidance of preachers, without the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Do what you want. No accountability at all. Whatever you read in the Bible, you do it. The, th the way you, you think you have to do it, that is how cults are made. Right? The reason why we do everything inside the church is so that there's going to be uh, order as well there's going to be order and God is not the author of confusion now in, in this church our business should be the business of God it should be the business of saving people that's why we should not forget that our job here in Simrib is to bring glory to the Lord by bringing the gospel to the lost people our job is to bring the gospel to the lost people. This church should be uh, in the business of the, uh, of the Lord and the, and the Lord is in the business of saving people. And we should not forget that. If we have men who are, are, are capable and willing to go, send them and let them preach the gospel in other places. If not, then we continue to pray for missionaries. We continue to support missionaries. We have a mission program. If you're not yet part of our mission program, you're missing on a lot. Why? Because you're not doing the business of this church. Right? If this church is the house of God, then our business should be the business of God. Next, if the church is the house of God, it means that the church should be operated by His law. Right? If this is God's house, He's the boss. If this is the house of God, what He says goes. If this is the house of God, whatever He says, our job is to obey. Right? If we are in our own houses, our leaders are the fathers. And what they say goes. Whatever, whatever they say, you need to obey. Amen. Everything they say, obey, obey, everything. Because right? they are the leaders. Hugot lang. Right? No, wala. But this church, our father is God. And whatever He says goes. And everything we need to know, He already gave us through the Bible. We are a family, we're brothers and sisters. But God gave us also some kuyas, right? Our pastor and the deacons as leaders. But we are not to operate this church the way the pastor wants to. We're not to operate this church the way the deacon wants to. We are only to operate this church the way God wants us to operate it. It should always be in accordance to the Word of God. However good the idea of the pastor is, we still have to be prayerful about it, careful about it, looking at the Word of God before doing it. Right? Because today, people have given pastors the uh, all the benefit of the doubt in the world. Uh, whatever the pastor says, nobody questions it. I, we, I have been to uh, churches that whatever the pastor says goes. Whatever. Nobody looks at the Bible. Nobody prays about it. As soon as the pastor says it, it has to happen. That is not the way we're... That is the house of the pastor. It's not the house of God anymore. And if this church is the house of God, he should always have the approval of everything that we do. If it's approved by him, do it. If, however good it is, if it's not approved by the word of God, stay away from it. This is the house of God. That's why we should be there. We, should, we have no authority to make a different kind of church other than the one that is revealed in the Bible. No authority at all. However good our ideas are. That's why if preachers here, the kuyas here, the, the pastors standing here behind the pulpit, we don't know the will of God, then we can never lead you 
right, to the th what God really wants us this, this church to be. That's why preachers, we have this responsibility to know the will of God. We have this responsibility to know what the will of God is, especially for this church. We have the responsibility to read, study the Bible, and make sure that we're bringing this church, taking this church in the correct direction, the way God wants this church to operate. It's always about God. It, it's his house, it's his rule, it's his, it's his law that we have to lift up. The Bible says, if we, uh, uh, the Bible says if we are fools, uh, if, we are, if we do not know the way of God, or the will of God, we are fools. Uh, uh, wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. If we don't know the will of God in this church, and the preachers are not preaching what the will of God is in this church, then we are not doing uh, what God wants us to do in this church. Now, the church is the house of God. Not only, that's the first point. Second point here, not only that the church is the house of God, what did our verse say in, uh, in verse number 15? Sorry, I didn't, uh, malayo ne. The house, uh, how to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. It's not only the house of God, it is the church of the living God. And this, just reading this, it should just fire you up. We are serving here a living God. We are serving here a God who's not dead. We are serving here worshiping a God who is alive. You know, you, uh, you go around Cambodia, go to the temples, go to the uh, places that where they offer incense. These people are zealous in what they're doing. They're worshiping, they're giving a lot of their time and of effort for gods who are dead. Or worse, for people who did not even exist at all. But they're giving their best. They're giving all they can. Muslims are even trying to... to uh, to sacrifice their own lives for, for something that they believe in. For people who are long dead. But Christians are people who we say that we are uh, preaching and we are uh, we're studying and we are worshipping the living God. We're worshipping a God that is alive. But what's, what's, uh, what's happening today is you go inside churches, it looks like it's dead. Yeah. Right? We're singing songs for the Lord. Some are not even singing. Do you realize that you're worshipping a living God? Do you realize that you're worshiping a God who is alive, who's with us right now, and you're not behaving yourself correctly in the church? Uh, you go to other services today, to the Pentecostal, to the Charismatics, they're jumping, uh, all of them, they're laughing, they're, all, they're doing anything. If you bring a, an unbeliever, send, it, send them to our church, send them to that church, they will say, that church is serving God. This church is now, why? Because you look like you're dead people. You look like you're serving a dead God. You know, whatever problems you may have at home, whatever circumstances you're facing now, you have no right to be sad in front of worshiping the living God. Uh, you have no right. In the Bible, even, even, even just uh, human kings, they're not allowed to frown in front of them or they're dead. But how dare we go to church, bring our problems here, and look like we are bringing all the problems in the world. No joy at all. Don't you realize this morning it was shown to us the power of God. Whatever problems you have, you're worshiping a living God and He is sovereign. He knows what He's doing. He allows you to have that and His will for you right now in this moment is to worship Him with joy and gladness in your heart. That is what we're supposed to be doing. We're serving a living God. Think about that. You're serving and you can't even smile about it. Can't even say amen to that. Can't even sing. Right? You, can't even, uh, you can't even give your best in service. Are you really serving a living God? Or are you just here out of duty? Or are you just here because you have to be here? Or are you just here because you, if you're here, you're not here, and you're t tomorrow you're going to be at school, you're going admin. Ganun ba? Hindi po, we're here because we're serving the living God. And this is our faith. Our faith lies upon the fact that our God is alive. First, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8. The Bible says here, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again in the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, and of the twelve. After that, He was seen of, uh, of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater, the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, which is, that means dead, but today some of you are fallen asleep. 
After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of he was seen of me also as one uh, as of one born out of due time. Now many people are trying to 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 uh, discredit the fact that God is that Christ really resurrected. But the Bible, my Bible, is clear that Christ resurrected. He rose again, and he was seen of a lot of people. And I believe that. I believe that's the reason why I have zeal in worshiping. That's the reason why I have joy in serving God. Why? Because he's alive. Because if it's dead, all of this are just, uh, uh, are just in vain. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, uh, jump to verse number 12. Now it's, if Christ is preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. The reason why we can be sure that someday we're going to be risen with him, because Christ has resurrected. He's the first fruits of the, them that are risen. And if Christ be not risen, then it's our preaching in vain. And your faith is also in vain. If you do not believe Christ to be alive, then you're free to walk out this door and not come here. You're wasting your time. Right? If Christ is not really risen, there are many things that I want to do on Sunday instead of coming here. Right? But I believe Christ is risen. That's why we preach. We have the confidence to preach because we are preaching the living God. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. Because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised uh, whom he raised not up, if so, be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if, the, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then ye also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most reasonable. But these circumstances, these things that Paul is saying, is, uh, we are not in this kind of circumstance. Why? Because our Christ is alive. Because our Savior is alive. And that is the big difference, that we're, the, the message that we're bringing even to these villages. The other day, uh, 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 the other week, Ponlu preached in the village. Uh, he said that he was making fun of Christ because Christ only lived for 30 years on earth. But Buddha lived for more than 80 years. And before, when he was not saved. But he said that now that he's saved, he realized that Buddha stayed dead. Christ is alive. He, 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 he was risen and he's alive even now. He's living in your hearts. That's why the song a while ago says, we're living for Jesus. We're not living for a person who is in the grave. We're living for a person who is alive now and working in our lives, working in our hearts. We're serving a living God. This is the house of God. And this is not just the house of God. This is the house of the living God. And if we preach that we are, that we are the people of the living God, then we should look like people who are alive life uh, it's not just in your countenance i know there are people who are normally just unhappy but deep inside they are you know it, it takes effort for them to smile just like my uh, my baby uh, uh her natural face is this right if you want to you have to uh, make effort to make her smile right but there are people who just look like they're frowning all the time but deep inside what i'm saying is the condition of our hearts right this morning it was emphasized by preacher alex that god is not really uh, 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 concerned with our offering. He's concerned with the condition of our hearts. Are we really serving or living God? Let us, only you can, uh, only you can uh, say that uh, for yourself. Next, and which is the last point. We'll, 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 we'll uh, expound this more. Let's read our verse again. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.15. The Bible says, uh, that Thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God, which we'll uh, studied, which is the church of the living God. And another description is the pillar and the ground of truth. It is the pillar and the ground of truth. The truth is the church business as well. right? But you might say, a while ago you said that, that, that the gospel is the business of the church. It is true. The gospel, we are to bring the gospel to people outside the church. And the, the gospel that we are bringing must be the truth. What is the, what, what is the truth? The Bible says in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man should become, should, uh, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The truth is the word of God. The truth is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why in this church, we are to live no one but Christ and live nothing but the word of God. We have to be the pillar and the ground of truth. What is the picture of this? The ground of truth, that is the foundation. We need to have that foundation in the truth. But not only that, we need to have a foundation, but we need to be the 
pillar of truth as well. We need to be lifting up the truth. Why? Because it's not God's will for us to do Bible study and not proclaim the truth that we learn. It's not also the will of God for us to keep proclaiming but not laying down the correct foundation. We have to have the right foundation and as we grow, as we learn doctrine, we are to be the pillar or lifting up the truth in the world. And then, I don't know if Milka has downloaded... Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Wag na lang. Imagine na lang. Right? You know, you know what pillars look like. Like this. Imagine two pillars and then we're lifting up the truth. That is, we are the pillar of truth. That is our job to proclaim the truth. But we have to be standing on the ground of truth as well. Right? There's, we have no job proclaiming the truth if we're not standing on firm ground of the truth. And that is the, the truth or the foundation that the Christ and the apostles laid, which we are building upon now, and we are proclaiming to the, gospel, uh, to, to the world. Now, we're going to look at the pillar later, but first, the Bible says that the church has to be the ground of truth. What does it mean? First, the church is the ground of truth by possessing the truth. Make sure that you are in the church that has the truth. Make, you, make sure that you are in the church that is teaching the truth. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye receive it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the, uh, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believeth. The picture is as Christ Tell the apostles. The apostles wrote here, uh, uh, some of them wrote the word of God, and it has been passed from generation to generation, and we have it now. We preach in this church that we have the word of God. We preach in this church that we are holding or preaching from the very word of God. We do not believe in, in, in what others are saying that there is no word of God today. Now, you, 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 you read a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, articles and all of these things. You even read people who has the audacity to say that the Word of God is still here on earth, but it's hidden somewhere and nobody has found it. It is preserved. So God preserved the Word of God to hide it from His people. Right? I, I just don't get the, 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 uh, 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 the logic in that. It, they're saying that God gave us the responsibility to follow every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, but He will not give us a copy of it. If, God's, if, if God will ask us, why did you not obey every word that proceeded out of the mouth of, of, of God? Well, Lord, you didn't give me a copy. I don't, I don't know what I was supposed to do. But God is faithful. He promised to preserve His word. When He said He will preserve it, that means we can have it today. We trust that we have it now. And it has been passed faithfully from generation to generation. And today we can know what the will of the Lord is by the word of God. And we have it in this church. We have the truth in this church. Faithful men who were... who who. Um, who, who gave us this truth. Not only the, did, was it passed down to us, but John 16, 13 says, How be it, when He, the Spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall come not, uh, speak of, He shall not speak of Himself, but whosoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. And He will shew you things to come. Not only does the truth handed down to us, but we are being taught the truth every day as we read the Word of God by the Holy Spirit that we possess. That's why the Bible says the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. That's why it's impossible for a person to say that he's saved and, leave, uh, and be deceived his whole life. It's only that there are only two possibilities. It's either he's not really saved, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit teaching him, or he doesn't care about the Holy Spirit teaching him. But if we just follow the Holy Spirit's lead and it's teaching, he will lead us to all truth. What did the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I, Paul, preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I deliver unto you first of all that which also I received. Right? Paul received it from Christ, gave it to the churches that he started. How that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, and that I was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. This is the message that we preach here, and we are possessing the truth. If we are to be the ground of truth, we need to have the truth in us. We need to have the truth. We need to have the truth, the, the message of the truth. How else can we uh, help people to come to know the truth if we don't possess the truth? That the church is the ground of truth. It means that we are to preserve the truth as well. 
Not only that we have the truth, but we have to preserve the truth. The church is tasked with preserving the Bible. We have this Bible because faithful men pass this on to us. Now, each generation has to be taught to observe all the things that Christ has commanded. This is something that our forefathers faithfully did. Every time they, 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 they shared the gospel to someone and they got saved, they're a member of the church, the next thing is to teach them all truth. To teach them the whole counsel of God. And this faithful man will pass it on to others. And it will pass it on to others. And now it's here. And the, the only way we can preserve the truth is to pass it to the next generation. Why? Because if we keep it to ourselves, then these kids will not have the truth anymore. It, it ends there. But our goal or our job is to continue to preach the truth, to teach the truth in the church, so that we are sure that every generation there will be people who are, will be preaching the truth. That's why it's important to pass it on to young people. We should not neglect ministry to the young people. We should not neglect teaching the truth to young people. Why? Because they are the future who will continue to, again, pass the truth to other people. As they faithfully did that, we are also to faithfully do that. Now, during the time of Christ here on earth, the Bible was the Old Testament scriptures. That was their Bible. And this was preserved by the Jews. Romans chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. The Bible says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? But much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now, during, this time of the, during Christ's time, the people who have the word of God are these people, the Jews. And the, and the way the scribes, the way they are translating or, or, or writing down this truth or the, the, the Bible was, in every page, they count every letter, every jot, every title. And if it doesn't add up, they're going to destroy the whole page and do it all over again. That is how careful they, they were in preserving the scriptures. Now, the same day today, we should have that kind of, uh, 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 we should give that kind of importance in preaching the truth as well. Be very careful in teaching the truth. Be very careful in passing the truth. Why? Because we don't know. The kids who are listening today, it might be planted in their hearts. And if we are mistaken, we're preaching to them the wrong doctrine. That is what they're going to carry their lives. That's why we have to be careful as well. The church is the ground of truth by understanding the truth. Not only should we have the truth but we have to understand it uh, the, the other day i posed that it's not enough that we possess the truth we must understand it it's not enough that we have a bible institute the church should be the bible institute that's why you know it's not enough to hear three preachings every week it's not enough you're not going to learn a lot from that it's better to supplement it with bible reading meditating upon the word of god reading the word of god and this church we offer classes for you to know more about the about the word of god that is our job and if you are especially if you are parents who are serious in passing it down to your kids we should know the truth and understand the truth not only that but the church is the ground of truth by defending the truth we have the truth we preserve the truth by passing it on to the next generation and while we are alive standing on the truth that were given to us we are to actively defend the truth jude, uh, jude verse 3 the bible says beloved when i gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation which was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend, contend for the faith Look at this, which was once delivered unto the saints. The Bible says it was once delivered, once and for all it was given. And now this faithful man, as I have said a while ago, passed it on until today. We're standing on the truth that was once delivered to the saints. And, and that is the position we are in today. And we are only able to maintain that position if we will actively contend for it. If we will actively guard it on every side. The picture here is, if we are here in this position, standing for the truth, on every side, on every truth that we preach, the devil has a counterfeit truth. Right? You preach this, the devil is preaching the same thing, just a little bit twisted. You preach another truth, the devil will preach the same thing, just a little bit twisted. And if you are not vigilant, and you are not actively contending for that, our position will not be maintained. We cannot maintain our position. That's why we have to continue to teach doctrine, teach doctrine, teach people what the Bible says, but also to contend for what we are preaching. Right? It is not, the Bible is not given to people who are cowards. Right? I'm not saying that we go out there and hamuntahin ang away. Hindi naman po ganon. The Bible says we still have to do it with love. Right? It has to be with speech uh, uh, with grace. Right? Seasoned with salt. And we have to uh, do it out of gentleness and kindness. But we are to contend for the truth. 
We are to contend for the truth. And there are right ways to do that, wrong ways to do it as well. Now, if we are doing our part, then praise the Lord. But we are, as a church, to be the ground, to be the ground of truth. We are to actively depend, defend the truth or contend for it. The church is the ground of truth by serious Christian living. The truth must be demonstrated. It's not only that we have it, we understand it, we preach it, we defend it, but we have to show it as well. It has to be demonstrated. The Bible says in uh, Philippians 2, 14 to 15, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Now, we can preach the truth, but we also have to be the light that is showing the truth as well. Especially in this country where we are in. Right? It's not enough that you open the Bible. Like you, you take them to the Romans road, in, even to the whole Bible and show them the truth. They don't even believe that the Bible is the Word of God. It's just a book to them. What they look at is us. They look at us. right? You're preaching the truth, but you, we don't see Christ in you at all. They'll never be attracted to that. Never be attracted to our faith. Imagine if we are at, uh, uh, preaching at Chanso and then we have a lot of uh, debt over there. Right? Nangutang ako na nangutang sa mga kapitbahay doon. Maniniwala kaya sa akin yung mga yan kung hindi ako nagbabayad? Of course not. Right? It has to be coupled with serious Christian living. I'm not preaching perfect, uh, perfect uh, living here. Nobody can be perfect. We can never be. But we have to try and keep trying to live what we are preaching. To be, ha- to be serious in Christian living. The Bible says, Titus chapter 2, verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. As we preach it, we have to be what we are preaching. Ito yung pinipreach natin. Though we cannot really reach the standard of our preaching, but we have to slowly be what we preach. We have to slowly do that. And we are not, as, uh, as, as we continually say this, we are not perfect and we don't condemn people who, 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 who fail to do that. We help them up and then we try to together be what we are preaching here. The church is the ground of truth by discipline as well. We practice discipline in this church. If we don't practice discipline in this church, we are sending a wrong message to the world. We're sending the wrong message to the world. If we have the truth, we understand the truth, we have to also uh, couple that with living for the truth and also uh, being uh, disciplining the truth. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, 6-7, to Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little living, living at the whole lump? That's why we discipline. We, don't, we discipline for the goal of restoration. We discipline people so that they will realize their mistake, give them a place to repent and to be restored. But... If not willing, we should not be double-minded to, take, uh, to, to kick them out of the church. If not willing, because a little living liveneth the whole lot. Purge out therefore the old living, that ye may be a new lot. It doesn't mean that the person has to be kicked out. It, the sin has to be, and the person who's repentant can remain. But if the person doesn't want to depart from the sin, then sin and the person has to go, right? That ye may be a new lump, as ye are unliving, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. If we don't, we're not serious about church discipline. We're not serious about following Christ, right? That's the reason why we have to be serious. Reason why we have our church polity, so that we have grounds for discipline, right? Hindi naman tayo basta-basta nagdi-disciplina lang. If we do that, we don't have any grounds for discipline, then it's going to be a dictatorship church, right? Whoever the pastor doesn't want, disciplinado ka basta, right? But we need to have a polity. It is what uh, is our grounds for discipline. That's why even, even the pastors have to be subject to that as well, right? I, there, are, there are pastors today who preach that the pastors can never be disciplined. Right? They make their constitution in a way that the pastor is above it. Uh, that members should be disciplined, but pastors, only God can discipline them. That's not the truth. It ha- if we're serious about church discipline, everyone needs to be under that. The church is also not just the ground of truth. As we lay down the ground, as we uh, 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 dig deep into the truth and have this foundation, then we should build the pillars who is holding up the truth. Right? Mahalaga po na firm yung ating foundation. Kasi kung mababaw tayo, yung pillar natin madaling bumagsak. Pero nagpapakalalim tayo. We're trying to be deep in the truth. We're trying to lay this deep foundation so that when the pillar of truth is there, it's not easily, uh, it's, it will not easily fall. 
we can we can we can uh, more firmly lift the truth up lift christ up lift the bible up by having the truth understanding the truth being serious in living for the truth disciplining people who are who are committing mistake and then being light in this world that is how we have to lay a correct foundation a strong foundation so that when we proclaim the truth it is it's uh, at its most at its most effective way right lalo magiging effective yung pagpo-proclaim natin sayang naman po yung bible study kung hindi naman tayo magngangaral Right? It's not God's will for us to just keep on having Bible studies and be quiet about it. Right? It's, a, it's, it's like knowing the truth but secret. Kami lang nakaalam, pag-aralan nyo na lang. Hindi po ganon. The reason why we lay the foundation so that we can proclaim it. Right? And hindi na naman dapat na proclaim tayo ng proclaim na hindi pa malalim yung foundation natin. Right? That's why it goes together. It is the pillar and the ground of truth. Maybe pillar was mentioned first because it's the, the first thing that is neglected in the church. Why? Nani-neglect po natin yung pagpo-proclaim. You know, there's this mindset in churches today that tayo-tayo lang, dito lang, dito lang tayo. Ito lang ang focus natin. Hindi po. Our focus is for us to help each other learn and be deep in the doctrine and truth and then proclaim that outside this church as well. Yung po yung hindi dapat natin nile-neglect. Nile-neglect. It is the pillar of truth. Right? You, you see the picture there. Sa taas po ng ating pillar is Christ and the Word of God. And as we have this great or, or deep and strong foundation, we can more confidently proclaim the truth in the world. The, the, that's why I want to start the, 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 the series here. In this description, the church is the house of God. If it's the house of God, it must be the most important house for you. Realize that it works only under the laws of God. Realize that God is the boss, not any of us here. It is the house of God. And it's the house of the living God. We are serving a living God. We should act as we are really serving a living God. It is the ground of truth. We are to lay the correct foundation. The foundation is given to us, the Bible. We have to be deep in that. And as we do that, we are to proclaim, to be the pillar of truth. We have to proclaim the truth. Are we, right now, the house of God, the church of the living God, the ground, the pillar, and the ground of truth? If not, that should be our goal. Right? If you see that as an individual church member, tulong-tulong po natin abutin yan. Tulong-tulong po dito sa simbahan. And, and as we continue to study what the church of God should be, hopefully we can understand more about it as well. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. As we start our uh, series about the church, I pray, Lord, that we... Uh